all night. The moon is bright. The crickets are just the right volume. Ideal conditions for meditation. The problem is that sometimes the conditions outside can be ideal, but the conditions inside are not. You make up your mind to stay with the breath and suddenly find yourself overwhelmed with thoughts of the past, thoughts of the future, hurtful memories. You can't just sit there and accept the fact that that's what's in your mind. You've got to do something about it. You've got to learn how to step out of the memories. And there are basically two ways of doing that. One is working with the me within the memory itself. You step into that world and you change it. If it's a memory of someone who hurt you, you remember, remember that okay, that happened, but now you've become the sort of person who doesn't get overwhelmed by that, who's not going to let it ruin your life. You've learned how to move on. You're now a meditator. You're doing something good with your life. That puts a new end to the narrative, makes it easier to pull out of it. It doesn't have the same sting it did if it just stewed over the events of the past. You now take into account that here you are meditating. You've survived. You come out and you're doing something wise with your life. If it's a case where you harm somebody, then you remind yourself to take this as a lesson. Okay, that was a mistake. And either you've already gone beyond that kind of mistake, or you're in the process of learning how to do that. Which, again, puts a new ending to the narrative. In both cases, the Buddha recommends that you spread thoughts of goodwill to yourself and to the other people. Think about things in terms of karma as well. Because karma goes back who knows how many lifetimes, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, until you have no idea of who started it. And after all those backs and forths, it doesn't really matter. What you need is some goodwill for everybody and the determination that you're not going to seek revenge. You're not going to hold animosity. You're going to come out with goodwill for everybody, sympathy for everybody, compassion for everybody. And again, that takes the sting out. As for the times when you harm somebody else, again, the Buddha said, make up your mind you're not going to repeat that mistake, and then extend thoughts of goodwill to everybody, to yourself, so you don't keep getting down on yourself about that memory. Because often what happens is when you get down on yourself about a past mistake, then another part of the mind will say, I don't like this being down. Maybe it wasn't such a mistake after all. And that sets you up to make mistakes again. So instead of getting down on yourself, you simply remind yourself this is a human condition. We live forward, but learn backwards. In other words, we can see our mistakes in the past, but as we're going forward into things, we have often very little idea of what would be the right thing to do. We don't have the strength to do the right thing, even though we know it. So now you're going to have compassion in yourself. And compassion for everybody else, so that if it was an intentional harm that you did the last time, you're not going to repeat it, because you know what happens when you do intentional harm. It comes back at you. So in this way, you tie up the narrative in a new way. You tie it up in such a way that you can get yourself out of it, and it doesn't have a lot of hooks and barbs to keep you there. That's one way of dealing with it. The other way is to learn how to look at the whole process. How does a memory come into the mind? How does the mind go for it? What, is the, what are the stages? And you learn this by trying to stay with the breath as best you can, and then noticing 
what happens as the mind leaves the breath. How many suggestions, how many whispers does the mind give you before you actually drop the breath and go off with the thought, go off with the memory? And the more quickly you can catch yourself as you go off, the more you're going to see what these are the stages that the mind goes through. And as you step back, it pulls you out of the narrative. It's like looking at the narrative from, narrative from the point of view of an, of an author or a critic or the producer or the director of a play, say. They can't let themselves get into the narrative so much. They have to be able to look for all the details, how it's being presented, how the actors are doing things. You step back, get out of your full emotional involvement with the memory. You see, it simply as a process of the mind where the mind fabricates these things. and then falls for its own fabrications. It forgets that it's fabricated them. It's like that old riddle. You're dreaming that you're in a boat, and all the members of your family are there, and there's a man in the boat with a gun. He's going to kill one of the members of the family. It's up to you to choose. And if, you can't, if you say, I can't choose any of them, he says, I'm going to kill everybody. So what do you do? Of course, the answer to the riddle is you, you wake up. But a lot of people don't remember the fact that it's a dream. They get all tied up in knots about which member of the family they would be willing to sacrifice. But if you remember, oh, this is a dream, then you can drop it. It's the same with the thoughts in the mind. You have to learn these are fabrications. things you put together. There's an impulse that comes in the past, and part of the mind wants to go with that particular narrative that has a particular appeal. And even if it's a horrible thought, it still has a kind of appeal. It's like dogs liking the smell of dead animals. So if you can learn how to step back and remind yourself that this is something made up, and have the choice not to make it up, then you can pull yourself out. I was reading a while back someone saying that mindfulness is a matter of saying yes to everything. And that may work for comedy improv, but it certainly doesn't work for maintaining the sanity of your mind. There are things you say yes to and things you say no. And a lot of the meditation is learning how to say no effectively to thoughts that will pull you down. You use your sense of judgment. That was another issue I was reading about recently when people learn about mindfulness being non judgmental, and they say, Well, how do you exercise judgment in your life when you're being mindful? It's on one of those websites where people offer answers, and unfortunately, the, the bad answers were the ones that were being voted up. Mindfulness doesn't mean being non judgmental, it means remembering. And part of what you remember are the things you say yes to and the things you say no, and how to say yes effectively and how to say no effectively. How to say yes to skillful things even when they're difficult. And how to say no to unskillful things in the mind even when they're attractive. Think of the image of the gatekeeper at the the gate to a fortress. The gatekeeper has to say yes to some people coming in and no to others. You say yes to the friends, no to the foes, no to the people who are dubious. And that way you keep the fortress safe. In the same way, mindfulness is here to keep your mind safe. And to remember, there are ways of effectively saying no to thoughts that can pull you down. Yes, the thoughts that can pull you up. So when you've heard good lessons on this, try to remember them. When you've learned through your own practice how to deal with these things, remember that as well. Because that's the store of knowledge that will really help you. <laughs>